Well, again, for a few moments, I want you to think about this question. Why do your children misbehave? Now, although there'll be a whole load of factors why our children misbehave, from tiredness to peer pressure to biological changes or fill in the blank, the Bible says that the heart of the problem is the sinful heart. This is what Jesus says in, Math in Mark chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. You see, just like us, children are sinners who need their hearts changed by Jesus. In Psalm 51 verse 5, David says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. You see, a child's default position is not innocent or perfect, but because of Adam and Eve's sin, they are in need of a saviour. And we see that in the early life of children. Whilst you have to teach children to obey you and to put on their clothes and to come here and brush their teeth, and to go to the toilet when you tell them, you don't have to teach children to disobey you or to rebel against you. Somehow that seems to come naturally. And so grace-centered parenting needs to address the hearts of our children because that's where the problem is. It's from within. And that means it's not just about controlling their behavior. I wonder if you've ever caught yourself thinking or saying these things about your children. Your sister can do it. You don't want to finish that sentence. I'll let you watch TV after you've taken your medicine. I've spent time cooking your favorite meal. Okay, just this once as a special treat. See, the challenge with all these is whilst they may control behavior, it's not necessarily with the right motive. You know, thinking that your sister can do it, well, that's manipulation is trying to control behavior based on the behavior of their older sibling, I guess, which may not be realistic. I mean, it might work for a while because children might want to be like their sibling and to look up to them, 
But what happens when they don't want to be like their sibling? Or they can't be like their sibling? Or what happens when they want to be like someone else who is allowed to do behaviour that you wouldn't allow in your own home? What about you don't want to finish that sentence? Well, that is fear. We're trying to control behaviour based on the fear of consequences of what happens next. And again, that might work for a while. Our children may be scared of us, which is not a good thing. But what happens when they grow up and they can stand up for themselves and they're not scared of you anymore? Or how about I'll let you watch TV after you've taken your medicine? Well, this is bribery. We're trying to control behaviour based on the promise of reward. And again, that will work for a while, perhaps. But what happens when the reward we offer isn't big enough or good enough? And suddenly you're in a negotiating battle with them about the reward before they'll do what you've asked them to do. And what happens if they reject our best and final offer? Well, this is a tricky one because our schools operate on this system. And it's also tricky because obedience does bring blessing. But we need to be reminded that the relationship comes first. It's grace before works, not works before grace. Or how about I've spent time cooking your favourite meal? Well, this is emotionalism. We're trying to control behaviour based on the guilt they should feel for not eating that meal. And again, that may work for a while. But what happens when their desire to do what they want to do is stronger than the guilt that they would feel towards us? Or what happens when they turn round one day and they just see it for what it is? Guilt. Okay, just this once for a special treat. Well, this is inconsistency. We're trying to control behaviour based on a reward which we wouldn't normally give. Now again, that may work for a while. But what happens when we don't let them do what we did let them do before? Or we don't give them the same reward as we did last time for the same request? Now look, as I say these things, I am deeply challenged myself because I've found myself saying these things and thinking these things as I've been preparing this. But whilst these may control behaviour for a while and it might look like success, especially to those on the outside, ultimately it won't change the heart. And ultimately, sooner or later, this will be seen. And we're going to see an example of this in action as we here read Luke chapter 15, 11 to 32. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. 
the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now, what we've had read is a famous parable and Jesus doesn't teach this parable primarily to show us how to be good parents. But he does teach it, I think, to show what God the Father is like. And in our parenting, we are supposed to point to God the Father. And therefore, I think there is something for us here. I guess most of us know the story. A father had two sons. The youngest son comes to him and asks for his share of the inheritance before he's died. The father gives it to him and lets him go. And the son makes a hash of his life and spends it all and returns to his father with only the smelly clothes he's wearing on his back. And yet wonderfully, the father welcomes him back with open arms, gives him a ring, fine clothes and a party. The older brother is there. He's worked for his father, he's obeyed his orders, he's followed the rules, he's probably said please and thank you at the table and done the washing up when asked. And yet as he saw how the younger brother had not followed his father's orders, not obeyed him, not followed the rules, and yet is treated like that, his true heart is revealed. See, if you're going to answer it, which one of the brothers in the end loves his father more? Is it the one who has kept the rules? Or is it the one whose heart has been changed and who's been shown grace and forgiveness? Seems to be the latter, doesn't it? Now let's be clear, grace doesn't mean no discipline and no consequences. There was a cost for the father's forgiveness. The youngest son had lost his share of the inheritance. Then the oldest son, we see something of the truth that following rules does not ultimately change the heart. You can have someone who keeps all the rules and yet does it out of the wrong motivation. They do it for what they can get rather than out of love. That's what we seem to see in the older brother's response. But that's not what God wants. God doesn't want someone to follow the rules to receive his love and acceptance, no. God wants someone to follow the rules because they know they already have his love and acceptance. So grace-centered parenting doesn't mean no discipline, but it does mean that discipline is all about changing the heart. So good discipline is calm. It's not about how we're feeling in the moment, whether that's anger or frustration or shock or hurt. It's about addressing the child's heart. Good discipline is clear in that we're disciplining them for wrong behaviour. So the command and the consequence for breaking the command need to be clear. It's consistent in terms of enforcing boundaries, following through on warnings and being united as parents. See what boundaries you have, how you discipline, will depend on the age and stage of the children. The personality of one child may not be the same as the other children if you have more in your family. But the aim is the same. We are addressing the heart so that by God's grace they can see their need to submit to God out of love for him in response to his grace. And before we move on to a final section, just reflect on these, uh, this question for a few moments. Think for a moment about the last time you disciplined your child. It may have been just before you watched this session. Was the focus of your explanation on their behaviour or on their heart? Take a moment to reflect on that now.
Now I've got one more thing to share with us in this session. We've heard, haven't we, that parents are sinners who need God's grace and that children are sinners that need God's grace. But I also want to remind us that our children are a gift of God's grace to us. Psalm 127 verse 3 says this, Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. It's a reminder that we have done nothing to earn the gift of children from our God. They are a gracious gift from him and God's gifts are there to be enjoyed. And I wonder if it's possible that in our tiredness, our sinfulness, our stress, that we could see our children as more of a burden rather than a gift and a joy. Is it possible that as we ferry them from one place to another, or we discipline them for the 50th time of doing the same thing, or we worry why, worry why they're not bothered about God, that they become more of a stress to us, more of a burden to us, rather than a gift and a joy. There is a real danger, I think, in the midst of family life that we forget that. We forget that our children are a gift to be enjoyed, a gift to be thankful for, a gift to be cherished. We live in very busy times as families where family time itself is squeezed and life always seems to be about doing stuff. I want to suggest that sometimes it may mean saying no to things so that we can have time together as a family to enjoy each other. And so as I finish, let me remind you and myself to not forget to spend time with your children, to talk to them, to eat with them, to make memories with them, to tell stories with them, to just enjoy life with them. See, however long God gives us with our children, let's make sure we enjoy them. And as we close, let's take some time to think and pray and look at these things now as you look at some more discussion questions that will come up on the screen.